Okay, welcome to the next session of our uh, course on computational GABA analysis. Uh, in the last session, I tried to explore a little bit the landscape of lattices, which means uh, what, how the effect uh, is when you change redundancy, eccentricity of the lattices. We have seen that there is no problem for the high redundancy frames, which in the discrete case uh, uh, corresponds to the continuous limit. So somehow, if you take A and B very small, let's say redundancy uh, 6, 8, 12, 20, whatever, then the frame operator will be practically a multiple of the identity. Therefore, the dual atom is just a rescaled version of the original version. I also remember some comments from people who have tried GABA analysis for audio applications in the early days. And they said, well, we have made a test. We can use the dual window as a dual window, the original window, up to a redundant or down to a redundancy of six or eight. If you go below like four or redundancy two, then you hear already that the reconstruction is a bad reconstruction. We would just say, well, it's clear because the frame operator is really far away from the or, uh, identity operator, even up after any rescaling. So um, I'm not sure if I will have time, probably certainly not today to, to talk about the preconditioning trick but that's an idea to improve the situation by kind of multiplying the frame operator with the inverse of its diagonal part, but also with the inverse of the diagonal part in the free transform side. But this is a different story. So the topic today will be more why, uh, uh, well, what, how can we uh, get to the goal of GABA multipliers? And it's clear from the terminology that GABA multipliers are just um, um, operators which appear by taking GABA coefficients and doing a synthesis after multiplication with some contribution. And because any lattice point in our family is having a contribution in time and frequency, we would assume that there's a weight uh, which is used. And sometimes people just say we have weights on the lattice points. But normally I prefer to say we have a weight in the continuous case, which is everywhere. And we can vary the lattices and see how different GABA multipliers arising from similar atoms, from similar lattices are actually close to each other. So I start now uh, the, by recalling a few basic facts so, so that you're back on track. I start with my standard assumption. Uh, and the redundancy is three over two, which means that our lattice, which are called lambda, with lattice constants A and B, is, uh, I can do this in between, is having 300, uh, 720 elements. So if I show you and compare quickly, the lattice with the joint lattice, which is always playing a big role, then the joint lattice has N divided by redundancy or two thirds of 480 lattice points. This is a family creating time frequency shifts. This is the corresponding family describing the commutator. So all the time frequency shifts which appear in this way. Via the Poisson formula for the symplectic Fourier transform you can get from one to the other, or I have this adjoint lattice command. Now there are meanwhile many different commands to efficiently compute the dual Garber atom and I want to emphasize the role of the dual atom viewed by the so-called Wechsler-Ratz condition. So the Wechsler-Ratz condition says, if you want to have a dual atom and there are many possible dual atoms, then you have to make sure that the short-term Fourier transform of, of this candidate G, uh, uh, GD, um, applied uh, with the window, with the original window at the joint lattice is one. Uh, so maybe I also show this to you. If you take the coordinate one or one, one, which is corresponds to zero, you should get uh, uh, just one. And if your, uh, if your, oh, no, you're, you're not getting one, you're getting one of a redundancy, that's okay. If you take all the other ones, so somehow I'm taking this matrix, but I convert it to a, 
to a vector and take all the other ones from number two and all together the lattice, the joint lattice has 320 elements. So I'm summing up of every element except the central element here. And you see here it's, it's uh, numerically zero. So maybe I take the absolute value of the sum to show that this is really not such a strange number, but it's really uh, uh, near the numerical precision. And uh, of course, the sample short-term Fourier transform is just this color product. Or maybe uh, to check it, if I multiply it with the redundancy, I'm getting a one. Now, uh, we will see why this is relevant. But before this, I want to recall that we have routines to compute the tight Gaber atom. So I would like to use, and that's important for Gaber multipliers, uh, windows Gaber atoms, which are such that the frame operator is the identity operator. What does it mean? It just means that if you use the constant multiplier one everywhere, that you get uh, the identity operator. So we're talking about a kind of symbolic calculus. Functions on phase space or on the lattices on phase space should go into operators. And of course, you hope that if you take constant symbols that you get constant multiples of identity and constant one ideally should go to the identity operator. And so this is granted if we fix the lattice with constants A and B by taking a tight window. So this is again a test. What can I say about the autocorrelation of, of the tight window? And it's just saying that uh, if I sum all the elements except the zero element, I get zero numerically. And also we have seen that there are these routines computing the dual atom are the same as computing the inverse frame operator applied to the atom G. So you see here, I'm doing right matrix multiplication. Or if you take the tight window, you would take, that's the naive way and the slow way, but it's nowadays still um, doable. You can take the square root of a matrix, which is positive definite, so practically the routine would say, you have to diagonalize the frame operator. Uh, if it's positive definite, you can take the diagonal elements inverse, I mean, one over and square root and you get this. So this is just a comparison that everything is fine. And now uh, again, some routines, what is the relationship between what I call uh, the original Garber family and the joint Garber family? So that's the, Gaber family, where the lattice constants are the ones coming from the adjoint lattice. And you see here, n over b is uh, at the position of the time. So you're taking the complementary divisor, but you're also switching the role of time and frequency. Okay, so uh, there is a, a, um, a joint family, and this is the joint uh, family for the dual Garber atom. So for the GT is this difference compared to the above one. And there is the tight element in the same uh, family or so. Now, it's clear that the number of lattice points of the joint lattice is 320. So if I, which is N divided by redundancy. So if I want to see what I can say about the Garber family coming from the tight atom, and you see they are an orthonormal system. So this is uh, um, O and B test uh, for the basis, of course, is they're spanning a 320 dimensional space. And um, the comparison, yeah, so this is a verification. Whereas the function family itself, this is a 720 families you're taking 720 samples of a short-term Fourier transform or scalar products. And this is the frame operator. Here you see it once more, it's the frame operator for the tight Gaber atom. And this is exactly giving the identity. And this is not the incidence that it's happening to happen here, but this is equivalent. If somebody is modifying your G in a little way, such that you do this, you can get uh, the, the tight atom and the tight atom is giving you a identity operator for the corresponding Gaber frame operator. We have seen here above that uh, the 
the uh, dual atom is by inverting the Garber frame operator. And you could also check that the biorthogonal family that you have here is obtained. Uh, maybe we can do this also. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. I'm start making a selection. Now we can do the uh, uh, GT pin for GTA. A pin is the pin of the G. Uh, what is it? G A prime. So uh, we have a condition number the G A and the condition number of the original family G. So maybe I'm getting these numbers first. Then you are seeing that the condition number of the adjoint family and the condition number of the original family are equal. In one of the earlier courses, I was talking about the wechsler rutz condition, but I, uh, this was pointed out to me correctly that this is not the wechsler rutz which is the biotechnology, which I just recalled above, but this is the uh, related to the ron shen duality result, right? duality result. And of course, the condition number of a family is the quotient over two numbers. And actually, the, both of the numbers are just rescaled versions of each other. So it's not just the quotient, which is equal. But uh, when you have an independent family, like the GA, you're looking at the Ries condition number. If you're having a frame like the G, you're looking at the frame bounds. And there is a simple formula, which I don't want to uh, check here, but that these are equal. Now, uh, I take the GTAP to be the first uh, row of the first vector. And I want to show you that the GT and the GTAB are actually uh, uh, the same up to a natural rescaling. Oh, no, this is not true. What's going wrong? To P. Ah, um, it's, 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 it's not uh, that the problem is not tight. It should be GD. Uh, and then I should also do it here. Yeah, oh, sorry. And then the dual atom should be the dual atom obtained via the adjoint family. So we can create the family, the Garber family or the joint Garber family. From the frame case, we do the dual frame. From the re-spaces case, we do the uh, biorthogonal system and we check uh, that uh, now everything is fine. That up to the scaling factor, which clearly is just a redundancy. So if I take this and multiply the second one with the redundancy factor, we are, no, that was the wrong thing. Yeah, we, I see. Yeah. Uh, we we uh, should get now a perfect uh, recovery. So um, no, I'm too sloppy. Yeah. So now finally we get it. Yeah. Okay. So this was a, a few things, but now uh, I want to also recall why is the wechsler rutz condition. Uh, which is this vanishing of the mutual short time Fourier transform of two dual windows, equivalent to the representation of the identity operator as a, uh, as a frame operator. And the hidden thing is the so-called Janssen representation. So what we do here really is we recall, and I'm just summarizing it in words, we recall that the Gabor frame operator with respect to a lattice, so a regular Gabor frame operator is commuting with certain time frequency shifts. Any operator having these properties has a clear structure. On the time side, so if you look at the matrix, you have a few side diagonals. Actually, in our case, we have B, which is 16 side diagonals. And each of them is periodic with period A. So we have uh, 24 periods of length, 20 in our case. But if you take the same thing to the spreading function, you find exactly that this 
spreading coefficients are only non-zero on the joint lattice. So whereas you would say, okay, in order to represent 16 side diagonals uh, and any of them has a period of 20, we make what we call a block matrix, a block non-zero matrix, uh, where you store all these 16 side diagonals as row vectors and uh, each of them has a length 20. So it's a B times A matrix. We could also store exactly the free transform of these coefficients and they are sitting on the adjoint lattice. So then you can ask yourself, well, oh, how do I get the coefficients? So do we have to compute to the whole, run the whole thing? And the answer is no. We have all the tools now. We have the spreading function can be written as just the short time free transform of G with respect to itself. So you're telling me, I'm interested in the situation where the lattice is A and B given by A and B and my atom is the G, then I am recommending, well, just look at the short term free transform GG multiplied pointwise with the joint lattice. So you have a Dirac comb, so to say, over the joint lattice and rescale it by the redundancy factor, then you get the spreading function. And as you see, I've pre-calculated this here, you're getting exactly the same thing. And of course, then you can, can apply the inverse of the multi spread operator, which says, well, give me now the operator, which is a matrix, um, uh, which is spread to mat of the right-hand side. Well, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I will do something uh, different, another command, which is just a convenient way. So I'm saying, well, I have to convert uh, the matrix, but now I'm saying, why do I compute the spreading function over the full uh, lattice if I'm throwing away all the values which are not on this? So I'm saying, take this spread to mat, but now this is a set of coefficients living on a small A times B matrix. Uh, and therefore I have to tell uh, MATLAB, of course, that I want to create an N by N matrix. I'm not sure if that's now correct in terms of typing, but while I'm running it, I can, now there is a correction with some brackets. Yeah, and you see, it's just a more convenient tool that's exactly telling you, what do I have to know in order to construct it on the spreading side? And it's just, I have to compute the redundancy. So how many lattices, N over AB, what is my atom and what is the short time free transform? Also recall that uh, SD, or, or usually we call it Weiss transform, VGG is a full uh, short time free transform of G with G and uh, VGG at one, which is uh, the first point in the lattice is of course one because my vector is my Gauss function has been normalized. So that's always good to have it normalized. That means here we're having a description of a Gabor family. And uh, so let's see what, what we can say about uh, the, now I'm taking the um, unnormalized. So I leave out the redundancy. I'm saying, what is the sum of all the coefficients which appear in this representation? A, B, uh, yeah. Okay, and this is a square th thing. So I have to sum over all the entries of a rectangular matrix. Uh, maybe also to, to check what is the size of the STFT of G and A and B. Uh, and it's of course N over, uh, N over B times N over A. So we have, distance B 16 in the vertical direction. So we get 30 positions in the frequency direction, which are the row positions in that STFT. And we have 480 divided by 20, which is 24 positions, that's N over A. Okay, and now what you see here is, is, is quite interesting uh, that uh, the total sum of the coefficients is, uh, is uh, three, so we have one at the center and therefore it's, uh, oh, sorry, no, that, yeah, it's, that's true, but it's not useful. We have to go for the adjoint lattice at this place. 
and or uh, it was surprised and it's the reason because I've, I did the wrong thing. So if I do this here, I see it's 1.442 in, in our case. And that means that uh, the norm of, uh, now we have to say, maybe we take, uh, uh, yeah, we take the identity operator and minus redundancy because I have uh, done this test on this times S and uh, we could have done this from the very beginning. No, uh, let me see. Okay, I think it's, I have to do right through. You see it's speculation, but yeah, okay. So th that's realistic. So yeah, because if I make my lattice constant small and smaller, I will get multiples of the identity. So maybe redundancy 20 would mean I'm getting roughly 20 times the identity operator. So I have to think of the Gabor frame operator as a Riemannian sum. And yes, you know, Riemannian sum is the sum of the samples divided by the length of the interval and that's uh, captured by the inverse of the redundancy or so. So in this particular case, a test where the, the, the Gabor frame operator is invertible is quite easy based on what I call, I call this the Janssen test. And it's in the master thesis of Thomas Churchendaler. Something like this, it's, it's probably it's a typo. Uh, he was uh, doing a master thesis with me many years ago and uh, he was doing experiments in that direction. So invertibility as such is not so difficult if you have this information. Okay, having done this prelude, uh, let me go now for the uh, discussion of Garber multipliers. Maybe.